Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. So we will be uh, just starting. So um, I'm happy to introduce our moderator, Kara uh, Krizak, um, the president of CWIL. Um, and she'll be moderating today's session. Um, and she'll introduce the rest of our uh, panelists today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kara Krezak. I'm actually the CEO of uh, CWIL Canada, which is Cooperative Education and Work Integrated Learning Canada. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the land in which I'm joining you from is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe's peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here alongside me today. This territory that I'm joining you from is covered by the Upper Canada's Treaty as in within the land protected with the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. And I encourage all of you to learn about the lands in which you're joining from. Uh, across this beautiful country today. Hopefully the sun is shining as it is here in the beautiful wine region of Niagara. As we're all engaged in the conversation of will, I'd like to acknowledge that the Indigenous people and their principles of learning by doing and passing along skills through generations and learning what we do, we can learn from their knowledge and history and practices. So I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I don't know uh, if, uh, Charlotte, if maybe you could stop sharing the screen just so we can get everybody's uh, pictures a little bit perfect. Thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure to be moderating today and to talking a little bit about uh, small and medium-sized businesses and the successes and challenges in work integrated learning. March is Seawill's Co-op and Will Month, so happy Co-op and Will Month for everybody that has been celebrating alongside with us um, on social media and various channels. Uh, and tomorrow is actually our first National Day of Work Integrated Learning, so this is well-timed. Uh, along our panel today, I'd like to um, welcome uh, a couple of our esteemed panelists. So if you could just wave when I say your name, and you can find more about the panelists in their hop-in profiles as their bio has been uploaded. So first we have David Long, who is the CEO of Sage Tea. Hello. <laughs> Um, Sal uh, Salar Charpe is CEO of Prepper. Salar? <laughs> Wei Go, who's the manager of Partnerships of Venture Lab. Perfect, Hi, Wei. And Nazim Regimov, who is CEO of Cucarella. Hello. Hello. So um, we'll learn a little bit more from our panelists as we go. Just a few housekeeping items. We have some questions that have already been distributed to our panelists, but if you have a question for them, we'll see if we can get time to it towards the end of the session today. You can put those into the chat and we will get to them at the end. If not, you can connect with us on Hopin. It's a great platform, network with people and connect with them in other ways. But we're hoping that we can, in the next 45 minutes, get through as many questions as we have. So. I'm going to throw out our first question, uh, and I'll just see who wants to answer it first. I think it's probably an interesting question as, as we've all been through a pandemic, which has changed the way in which um, all businesses have interacted with students. So I think um, the first question I'm going to ask you is, how has the pandemic into, impacted the will experiences in your organizations and how you've interacted with students and how have you overcome some of those challenges? Anybody want to take a stab at it first? Okay, David, go ahead. It's a little bit hard to hear you, though, so I'm not sure if you can get closer to your microphone. Um, yeah, well, uh, we did all of our, we hired two, two co-ops um, during the, the pandemic, and um, they, they were very, very successful. I think we set a new standard. I don't know if it was a coincidence, but th these, these two really, really worked out. Um, did the pandemic have any effect on this? I think the answer is probably no. I think we, you know, we just got lucky. Uh, <laughs> other than that, I mean, we did the interviews over Zoom. Um, and I don't know what we had to say. Obviously, the jobs were all work from home. Nobody seemed to have any issue with that. 
That's great. So it is a little bit hard to hear you, David. I don't know if there's a way to get uh, a, a little bit closer to your mic, but he was talking about you know, doing interviews on Zoom and uh, connecting with students remotely, obviously. So I'm just going to pass it along. It looks like Salar, you also had your hand up there. Thanks, Cara. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's been an interesting time over the last year um, in terms of assessing new interns uh, or new hires coming in for uh, work integrated learning. The, the last few years, we've been uh, incorporating a challenge based uh, assessment. So, as uh, you know, candidates apply, we go through that process of uh, looking at the merits and then going through our process of internal phone interviews and internal discussion to prioritize. So, um, keeping it really simple three steps. So, that didn't change too much. What did change, though, you know, we had to close our office and uh, kind of rebuild a culture. Um, as our team was growing. And so uh, we really needed to start to be more intentional about that, um, you know, the environment that we're creating, being kind, like being conscious about, you know, the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of the individuals, making camera optional, like, you know, having camera on all day long uh, can be exhausting. Um, it impacts people in different ways. And then at the same time, like, you know, how do we, make work fun. Um, we were started experimenting with augmented reality, virtual reality of uh, creating a virtual work office um, using a platform called Verbella, um, which was kind of cool. Like we did our holiday celebration um, in 3D. We were hosting music in a virtual screen in an environment. Um, so that was really nice. Um, at the same time, we, we're an agile organization. We do sprints. So part of that is a daily stand up. And, what we did is we incorporated, before we talk about work, uh, practicing daily gratitude. And I, I find just from the feedback from our team and the interns that really kind of, you know, put their day on a positive note, because you don't really know, like when you're not sitting beside somebody to see how what's going on in their household or the pressures of the pandemic, um, that was really interesting. And uh, we, we got a lot of positive feedback from that and then the other last notes around this is uh just being really proactive about the offboarding process as well in terms of um seeing what we did well and also listening to you know where we can improve so that the next cohort of interns that are coming in um especially because we're continuing this remote work and uh, learn environment uh, at least in our organization for the foreseeable uh future uh, to be able to have those continuous improvements. So that, that's been our experience. I'll pass it back to you. That's great. Thanks. So I guess just to build off of that before we move on to the next question um, with either Wei or Nazim, is there things that you've learned as you've onboarded the students that you'll keep doing um, now that you've been through these experiences, uh, things that you'll never go back to? Um, I guess I'll start. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Tara. Um, there are quite a few things that we've learned through this experience. Uh, so Venture Lab is a global um, innovator hub. So we, we hire students for our, our organization throughout the pandemic, but we've also helped our clients who are tech startups also hire students so that we um, help them eliminate some of the hurdles that they, they have to go through to get help. So throughout this process, uh, we've really found the importance of expectation setting from the get-go. So, um, you know, students are typically, especially through the Will program, with us for a finite period of time. Um, and whereas before, if we were in a physical setting, we can sort of just they can observe and see what we do, how we do it. Um, like Salar said, uh, getting on the culture. Uh, just by observing and being, now we have to be more explicit about this is expectation, this, this is the scope of the project, and this is uh, your role and participation. Um, and also having a clear channel of communication for them always to be able to reach out to us and talk to us, uh, whatever the means. Okay, thank you. Anything you want to add in there, Nazim? Um, maybe. Uh, um... <clears throat> I, I like what Salar said about the experience, how they organize the process. And it's really um, 
would give it gave me some insights so i'll try to implement one of your techniques uh so what um i found uh so far um pandemic didn't change our uh process because we were w working remotely for the last two years uh with software company so it, it wasn't a big shift for us uh but um uh, what I noticed that our uh, employees, they found remote work, uh, some advantages in remote work. Before uh, before pandemic, it was like something not as good and something they, they uh, something they would prefer to avoid. Uh, but now after pandemic, it became a new norm. And it's, uh, it's uh, there, are, uh, there are lots of uh, advantages in working remotely. One thing I noticed, though, is that um, uh, we should limit uh, video conferencing with our employees. Um, but we still have at least one session a week, uh, a stand up meeting, um, morning call, um, during which we turn on our cameras. All other days we turn off cameras because it's exhausting. Uh, the, uh, people think about how they look, uh, how uh how to communicate and it takes some energy so we uh, we use that model otherwise uh, uh, this remote work uh, helped us to focus on right metrics and to put everything uh, what is not as valuable aside that's great thank you i think we've all could have an entire conference about how to do unmeetings um i'm sure we would all <laughs> enjoy that in a tent <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask Wei to start us off on the next question. Uh, and t t talking about um, HR practices with SMEs um, and small, medium-sized businesses, it's very different for a smaller, medium-sized business to um, onboard and have all of the the HR best practices. We know that the big companies have. Uh, lots of people are, are, are really strong on campus recruitment uh, strategies. How, what do you think are some best practices for SMEs or some of the challenges and, and tips that maybe you've seen that people overcome that? Thanks, Carol. Um, so Venture Lab, between 2020 and 2021, we have worked with a lot of startups to help them recruit. Um, one way we work with these companies is, is through talent initiatives uh, to attract and retain talent. So with the WILL program that we, we collaborated uh, between the School of Seneca and also um, Career Ready program, we facilitated talent matching programs with companies in our community and the uh, WILL students. So for example, um, this year we're planning a virtual career fair. So we'll get, I, I believe the, pl the platform is called Remo. So it, it sim um, simulates a virtual but real career fair where um, you're in a space and you, you have these clusters of desks and we want our startups to host these desks with, with students coming through them so that they can talk to these startups. Um, we find, like you said, the number one challenges that the startup face is that they don't have the time. They don't have the time to do the hiring. They don't have the time to do the job description posting. They don't have the time to, to interview. So if we can help lessen the, the amount of effort that they need uh, in order to take on a talent, um, and then that's that's um, bonus. I just want to share um, tips on on how you manage your HR processes when you're onboarding students and and, and uh, working with them as a small business or small medium business. David. I can answer that. Can you, I turned up my mic too. Can you hear me? It's okay? better. Yep. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. So um, I'm not going to name particular schools or universities that I work with, but there's one in Ottawa that I find to be just excellent. Uh, they have a way that I can publish uh, the skills that I'm looking for, uh, and I can talk with the people uh, who, who run the hiring program. We have a really good relationship. And at Sage T, we look for very, very specific things. Um, the stuff we build, you're not going to find anywhere else in the world. That's that's how we lead in the high tech business is we build stuff that nobody else can. So 
you know, by definition, there there is no one in school that you're going to find that has the skills we're looking for. And if there were, then I'd change our business model. Um, so, you know, we look for uh, people who can um, solve a problem they've never seen before. Um, and uh, uh, when we do uh, hiring, we need people who can demonstrate that they can solve some problem. Um, and uh, when I, we go into interviews, you know, what I've started doing lately is actually just writing a very simple coding problem. And then I ask the candidates who, all, they have all have great cover letters. Okay, can you, can you do some code? Um, and actually this last round, I had 17 applicants. Not one of them passed the test. Um, and it's interesting because the, when I did the, this hiring through the school last time, I nailed it. I had two unbelievably successful hires. Um, but uh, so then I introduced a, a test and they all failed. Um, so uh, I think that the lesson is that you have to um, like, well, look for, look for uh, institutions. If you're an employer, look for institutions that have programs where you can publish what you need. Like there's two kinds of hires. There's ones, and I get these calls all the time. People saying, I have this candidate, would you like them? And I think, well, you have no idea what I want. Universally, I say no to anybody who's even going in. They don't know a thing about me or what I'm doing. And they're saying, can you hire this person? No, absolutely not. Um, but uh, if, uh, if uh, and only some schools will do this. Like uh, I, I, some of them, you know, I say, I'm looking for this particular kind of skill. Do you have anybody you think might be able to come close to this? And some, if I put this out there, they're like, we'll see what we can do. And maybe they get back to me. But there's one school in particular where I give them a job description and they publish it, they promote it uh, for months. And then it, it gives me a way that I can advertise. Um, and then from there, they have a process that I can go through uh, and select candidates. Um, and what I try and do is I run this experiment. Um, I do not lower my standards, but I run the experiment often. And even though like this last group, none of them passed the test, I said to the school, that's okay, we're gonna try it again in, uh, in three months. And they also took that feedback back to their, their students saying, listen, you need to get better at solving problems. Um, and uh, so we have this dialogue. So that's how, you know, we do hiring now. And uh, I've, my team here, they are all A's, every one of them. And it wasn't like that at Sage T even two, three years ago. We had like, you know, a couple of A's and B's and a lot of C's and D's. I think the pandemic actually was an opportunity to get rid of some B's and C's. And we actually are all A's now. And my team internally, they are really uh, honest. They don't like somebody they will say so in fact uh, um I, I will not even think of bringing somebody to the team unless i'm really sure that they're going to get along with the team so we're at that standard um and we we you know um it's like matchmaking sometimes you can just tell you know the team is like when is so and so starting and like they've already started work over the weekend and other ones we know now within like 30 seconds this is not working um, so that's how we do hiring here. So, you know, again, just to summarize, if you're an employer, advertise your job and promote it with institutions. Uh, and I think institutions, they need to have really good systems for having a pipeline um, of feeding candidates through. And you're only going to, you're going to try a hundred uh, candidates and you maybe will hire one. I think that's what your ratio is. Thanks so much, David. And uh, it's interesting because those partnerships with uh, the institutions, both with career offices and work integrated learning offices, co-op offices, you know, they they are their their pulses on the talent that is there. Um, and um, each institution runs a little bit differently. So, um, but they're in your backyard, and and a, a lot of them do act as an extension or um, can help you with your HR. So I think that's a really great point. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Nazim and then Salar if you can talk a little bit about um, how you've had to change your approach working with new talent. Like, how does your talent style 
differ depending on if it's a student, you know, knowing where they are in their careers, that they are still learning. So Nazim, maybe if you could start us off, like what are some of the, the things that you do to make a student feel welcome in your environment and knowing that they're just sometimes is their first work experience? Yeah, uh, so uh, I believe, or uh, I strongly believe that every, every student want to be a star. And uh, my, um, my responsibility as an employer is to give a student that opportunity to, to, to become a star. Um, um, definitely, a, a candidate should meet certain criteria. Yeah, for example, what David mentioned, um, test is no bread. So a, every student should pass a test. But um, we also look at uh, how students uh, communicate with uh, other uh, uh, students. Mm -hmm. For example, if uh, he has a side project where he works with other students to develop something, that's a good sign he's a team member, and that's a plus. Um, if he has a hobby, um, that's another plus. If it's in his domain, it's definitely a plus. Um, if I see uh, uh, an interest in his eyes when he's talking about uh, his university, his courses, um, that means he's interested in what he is doing and he has uh, an ability to become a strong professional. So, and my responsibility as an employer is to give him that opportunity to improve, to grow professionally. Um, and um, um, I'm happy when I hear from some people here in Okanagan when they hire our uh, former employees, when they say, Nazim, uh, thank you for training this guy. He's really great. So that's, uh, I'm happy. And when I hear from one of our students uh, that uh, for four months uh, during uh, his co-program with our company, he learned more than four, three years at university, that means a lot for me. Could I jump on something yep. you said there, Nazim? Yep. Hobbies. Yep. Uh, I have been uh, seeing more and more students, like the bottom line is I think in the tech business now, if you're applying, you want to have a portfolio. Like if you were going to go to art school, uh, like my son is applying to go to yep. art school and they have to do a portfolio where they have to do different kinds of drawings and like do the whole thing. Okay. And I think if you're in the tech business and if you want to get a job as a programmer, these days you have to have a portfolio. Uh, and what I've been doing when I when I see people um, uh, applying, I go, so what What have you checked in GitLab? Uh, you know, sh show me something that you made. And, 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 and what do you do for your hobby? Like a real computer programmer, okay, after they've had dinner, what are they doing? They're programming, right? They can't help it, right? So any real computer programmer, they're going to have a ton of stuff. And I've started doing that. Like, so what's this project? It may, may have no relevance to what I need, but I want to know, what do you find interesting? Uh, can you show me, you know, something that you made? And, and uh, the really good programmers, programmers will be like, well, I made this robot uh, and I programmed it. Well, what did you like to use assembly? Really? Oh, you know, we just start talking about his things that they find interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that gives me a really big, like uh, I, I can tell somebody lives, eats, and breathes technology. They couldn't help themselves. This is somebody you want to talk to. Um, so if you're showing up at an interview and you don't have check-ins in GitLab, if you don't have stuff that you can show, um, I'm I'm going to probably at this point end the interview. Yeah, so, in um, so that would be my advice. If you want to. If you want to get a job now, you have to be walking in with a portfolio of stuff that you've made that you're proud of and you want to talk. Thanks, about. David. And and the same. I, I think uh, I've done some recruitment. I've actually I used to have a recruiting company and I worked with technology firms and having that portfolio and 
being able to discuss, uh, you know, their passions, right? And, and it doesn't matter what you're looking at. If you're going to hire an HR student who's going to help you with your HR processes, they should be passionate about HR, um, as with any any experience, and know what you're looking for. Maybe, Salar, if I can pass it over to you to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the cultural leadership pieces you put in place so that students feel welcome and that they know how to uh, navigate your your environment so that it that it's a good experience for them. Thank you, Kara. Um, yeah, I think, you know, again, with operating in a remote environment, just that notion of intentionality and being proactive, uh, when interns on board, you know, we have a series of sessions for them to understand, like, get to know the business, first of all, like, what do we do? What's the environment like? Who does uh, what? Who's responsible for different things? But then, um, again, with that intentionality, having frequent me meetings where it's one-on-one, -on -one, where they have a safe space with their uh, direct reports so they can talk about you know what do you want out of this learning experience because really first and foremost this internship is for you to build up your skills practice with maybe certain things that were in theory in school that you didn't get a chance to uh, practice and uh, then on a bi-weekly basis we keep benchmarking on these throughout the internship uh, so that you know they have that sounding board and they have the floor uh, to feel comfortable that, you know, the first half of that meeting, 30 minutes, uh, they get to talk about what's important to them. Uh, if they're struggling with something, how can we support them in uh, getting connected to additional resources, whether it's internal, within the organization or external through a partner uh, or through an advisor. Um, I think that's, that's really been helpful in terms of building their confidence. And like, you know, the, the greatest thing that we've seen is uh, some of the interns that entered, like they had the skills, they had the portfolio to David's point uh, to get the position, uh, but they didn't necessarily have the, the confidence or the, 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 the willingness to ask questions perhaps or communicate their thoughts openly or share their ideas. And then halfway through the internship, because of this, uh, you know, being given that airtime uh, once every other week and in the daily standups, uh, they're now building their confidence. They're scheduling their own meetings and, and doing things. Um, and I think that, that's been really effective. Like the technology tools, like Slack, whatever, Zoom, doesn't really matter. It's about them like giving the supports and uh, building them up so that they can feel confident in being able to do that. And so uh, I think that's that's been a big key takeaway, especially during the pandemic. The other thing that we've done is we do a weekly lunch and learn uh, where we rotate. So everybody gets to teach everyone else. It's not me. It's we, We're a completely flat organization. So there's no hierarchy from that uh, perspective. We're just all producing towards this common goal. Uh, and so everyone brings something to the table. Everyone has something to teach. And uh, that weekly lunch and learn, I think it's been really impactful in terms of, again, giving that stage. Uh, in a comfortable setting, you know, they don't start, but uh, they can contribute. And then um, one of the recent experiments that we've added is uh, there's this doctor, Dr. Mark Golston. He's a Forbes author, uh, 30 years in practicing psychology. And he's done this experiment where while we're in Zoom, he types this hashtag of what made you happy today and also what made you hurt today. So no one speaks while we're on the Zoom call, but everybody types how they're feeling. And I, I find like, again, you know, that uh, active consciousness of, you know, this is a pandemic, people are under different stress, sure, they can perform the task, but are they okay? And uh, being able to have that uh, empathy and being able to kind of authenticate emotionally with, uh, with the interns beyond, uh, like, sure, everybody has stories and tasks to get done. And we have our objectives for a sprint. But um, you know, balancing that human aspect, I think it, it's it's challenging as, you know, manager, you have multiple priorities, but uh, that's something that I learned and I'm practicing more to get better at. So, so yeah. Thank you.
That's great. It's interesting because a couple of things you said I thought of is it's interesting how um, tech over the last 20 years has really dr driven a lot of cultural changes in the workplace, whether that's dress down days, you know, they, the, they, and it wasn't because of war on talent. So you're all, you know, looking at uh, for that top talent as well, right? And so you're th talking, Salar, some of the things that you put in place, it's also because you want these employees who are with you uh, from a will experience to, um, you know, have that opportunity to look at them as a talent pipeline for future opportunities down the road, which is one of the reasons why um, employers really engage. And then I think the other thing that you t touched on that sometimes gets lost in this is that these will programs are integrated learning. It's work that's integrated learning with their academics. So, you know, to David's point, Nazim, and, uh, you know, you're talking about like, these are the best experiences or, or these are the, the types of students that you're getting. They're taking what you're learning and, and, um, and, and bringing that back to the classroom and it helps them back in their academics. So I think that that's that whole concept of that true partner and work integrated learning. Nazim, I'm gonna get you to start us off with the next question. And um, what, what advice would you have for someone who's looking to bring in student talent that, you, that never has before? So, um... Um, I would um, ask to uh, communicate. Over communication is better than uh, not enough communication. And that is one of the biggest challenges uh, I uh, find as an employer. Uh, sometimes um, employer and head of the company is considered as an authoritative uh, person. And when you say, I, I'm a producer, I'm not a developer. So, and, but when I talk to uh, students who are computer science students, developers, uh, and I say some stupid things about uh, programming, which I, uh, I have some slight ideas about that, but uh, I think I heard that it should work that way. And I found that uh, they accept that without uh, criticizing. So and at, so, at some point, it, it can snowball the problem and they can um, start going in wrong direction and you will find it out only um, uh, after a few months. So uh, communicate a lot uh, and mentor a lot and always have a, a senior supervisor, senior developer who will be uh, helping uh, students uh, uh, because otherwise, uh, 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 students, they have uh, good intentions, but uh, they uh, don't have enough experience and they uh, don't see a uh, um, problem as a whole. They don't see project. They uh, think that if something is working, it's fine. And they uh, they just don't uh, understand that in, in a day that can break. Uh, one software which we developed uh, started growing and it looked good at some, but at some point we realized that it was like a patch and killed. And uh, when we change something here, it broke the whole thing. So they don't have understanding of architecture. You and it's your responsibility as an employer to um, to help them with that. Have someone to supervise the process to build to build an architecture. Definitely. Wait, how about you? Any advice that you would give to somebody who's never hired a will student or brought a will student into their organization before? Uh, I'm, I think I've touched on a couple of them already to have a set project because these are finite uh, help that you're getting. Uh, a set scope and project and expectation. Uh, like the, Nazim says, over -com communication is better than under communication. Um, and reaching out to each school's talent department can also be really helpful. Um, like like I, we, we talked about before, um, these wheel offices typically have their hands on the pulse of the talent pretty well. Um, so talking to them, communicating with them, not only with a job description, but with you know what you need can typically help them find you a match much better and much faster. Um, and lastly, uh, so here at Venture Lab, we're starting to uh, to work on an internal mentorship program 
where uh, the leadership or perhaps um, the manager level of, of, of people in Venture Lab um, can volunteer as a mentor to those who wants to be mentored. Um, I think in having some sort of guidance from someone that's not you, that you're not directly reporting to uh, can give you immense help in help, helping to navigate the dynamics of, of your new workplace. Those are all great tips. Thank you. Um, I think that they're, they, they, those are all great best practices. And um, there's a lot of tools out there to help as well that the schools have that, that are ready made. And especially as small, medium sized businesses, it's not necessarily um, something you have at your fingertips, but I know that a lot of the institutions have. So the next question is my, my, a bit of my favorite question. Um, and I'm going to get David to start us off. And then I'm going to let anybody jump in after that. Um, one thing that I hear often, I've been in uh, this the world of uh, co-op and work integrated le learning for almost 20 years, is that people are surprised at what students can do for you. It seems like a lot of work to onboard them or oversee them, but when you do, you're blown away. So David, do you have a story, a favorite story of a something that student has done for your organization? And then I'm going to ask Salar, and then Nazim, and then Wei. Yeah. Um, so the one that that really blew me away was um, my last hire, who uh, I brought in to uh, improve, like basically it was online marketing automation. Uh, and CHC had struggled with its websites for quite some time. Uh, and he basically turned our entire web front end, anything on the internet upside down. Um, and I had people who before were like, oh, Dave, to Dave, who's doing, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you. Uh, uh, so, you know, well-known, you know, businessmen were after my guy uh, when before they were like, oh, so that was a coup. Um, and it gets better. This guy, uh, he absolutely loves technology and he knew that we were doing stuff in artificial intelligence. And he asked, you know, can we uh, do something where I could work on your AI code? And I had hired him for online marketing. I'm like, you wanna do AI code? Well, this guy is a monster. Um, and he's actually working with um, uh, a partner of ours, Dr. Arash Laskari at the University of New Brunswick who has like personally called me and said, Dave, can I keep working with this guy? Now, Dr. Lashgari, he has 11 customers that he's dealing with. Like, I'm very lucky that I get any of his time. Um, and when he does projects, they're for big multinationals, Canadian government, stuff like that. Um, and he's at calling me to say, can I work with your guy? I really, he's amazing. Um, and, you know, artificial intelligence is the core to what we do here. So. Uh, I had no idea that this guy even had these talents. Uh, good that he asked about that. Good that I listened. Um, and like he's just he's set the bar now for for hiring, uh, very high. So that, that that's was great. Thank you. Over to you, Salar. That's awesome, David. I love those stories. Um, from our perspective, as I mentioned, uh, I think earlier, uh, we don't look at resumes first when we uh, start our assessment process. It's always uh, through some sort of skills challenge. Uh, so in our last cohorts, we had a, a machine learning intern, uh, internship entry level, so nothing um, too crazy, but uh, one of the candidates, she was studying biophysics um, at Ryerson, and uh, she had no background knowledge in machine learning at all, but she was just super passionate, like passionate problem solver. She's the epitome of, of that. Downloaded a machine learning book for free two days before and took the challenge, taught herself Jupyter Notebook, took the assessment challenge, and I was super impressed. Like from you know, from the short list of six, seven candidates that we reviewed, we ended up hiring her. And then throughout the entire internship, she kept this uh, you know, habit up of continuous learning, just continuing to take the next opportunity. Hey, there's an AWS learning opportunity. I'll, I want to take it. Um, and then continue to surprise us throughout the entire journey. Any problem that we gave her over the course of four months, 
uh, tackled it head on, and uh, we still keep in touch. And you know, she, you know, any uh, future employer that she goes to, she'll get a uh, you know a, a glory uh, glorious uh, reference from me. But um, yeah, that's one of the stories that I want to share. Thanks. It also goes to show how um, it's the students' experiences count towards their. We always tell the students, like, you have work experience. These work experiences count toward the next experience in its building. Over to you, Nazim. What's your favorite story? Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> With our students, we worked on uh, multiple projects, including augmented reality, text to speech, uh, voice recognition, and um, yeah, I, I I I notice that sometimes they um, uh, you know so I can't uh, just find one example. Uh, um, maybe um, maybe I'll take a look from from a different uh, perspective. Yeah, when we're talking about co-op students, um, about students, why I like hiring, hiring students, um, they have. Um, uh, fresh view, and also they are um, they are passionate, and they feel accountable. Um, not just uh, for the company, but also as as students. Um, and uh, when they ask me to help them with the uh, plans which they create for for education for universities. I see that they are passionate about uh, growing, and uh, it happens with every student. He starts um, or she starts filling um, the, the plan, and uh, I see that uh, he or she uh, are passionate about um, the growth. Uh, they uh, become planning their um, education and their work experience. So that's what inspires me. Maybe I didn't answer your question, but. I think they're all good points that uh, pick up on what we're talking about as to why they're great. Like why, you know, yeah. they can surprise you in a lot of ways. So thank you. How about over to you, Wei? Do you have a, do you have a favorite example or something that's blown you away? Yeah, absolutely. We've had a few students we really lucked out uh, in the past few semesters that were just absolutely outstanding. Uh, one of them in particular, uh, we onboarded her last fall. Uh, we started hiring in September. So as you know, we were scrambling a little bit. So we really relied on our um, academic partner, um, Will Office, to, to really pull through for us. Uh, they advertised the job, um, personal, uh, personally did outreach because Will, um, and to be, to qualify for the career ready funding, you know, there are certain criteria. So they did personal outreach um, shortlisted a bunch of candidates for us, and we ended up on uh, taking on one of one of the uh, one of the students. Uh, she started in October of last year, so you know it's a one semester kind of job. She had basically two 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 and a half months, um, and her her the scope of her work is to develop a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy for the entire organization. Now, Venture Lab is, you know, um, it's, it's not the largest organization, but uh, we do have 40 people on the team. Uh, and it is the first uh, strategy, inclusion, inclusion and diversity strategy of this kind for, for us. Um, so although we, we did provide her with a framework, she was tasked with all the heavy lifting of doing the research, uh, developing the strategy, uh, coming up with recommendations, and actually rolling out the strategy to each department first to the leadership and then to each department across the organization, all within two and a half, three months, give or take. Um, and all this was done virtually. So she has to, at the same time, build trust, build report to get the feedback that she needs internally in order to, to really pull this off. And she did such an amazing job that, you know, after the semester, we, uh, we, and, and she, we were also lucky that she graduated. So we took her on full time. Um, and now she's continuing, she still runs this, this strategy and still um, is working with us to really make it part of the DNA of the organization. 
Um, and and really, like David said, she's really passionate about it and took a, took it upon herself to run um, a monthly lunch and learn where she educates the entire team about what it means to be, you know, to be um, to to think about equity, to think about inclusion and diversity. And so, yeah, that's that's one of the many stories that we have to share. That's great. Thank you. I can uh, think of the the times that I've seen students and as they grow in their career and I'm hearing back from them years later, it's always so enjoyable to hear about how they how far they've come and what they started off and doing. But it uh, it is amazing to hear how they are, they they blow people away with what they can do when they come into the organization. So I'm just going to take a quick peek on this side here, knowing that we have about five minutes left. I've told my son in the basement to get off of Fortnite because I started lagging. So I had to do a quick text on the side, which he knew. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, my, my internet stays sta stable. So there was a question about productivity and uh, working remotely. And I, I, I'm going to bring this back to kind of perspective still. Um, I, I will let you know that the schools have been keeping a pulse on this. Um, you know, what is the satisfaction level of your students? Uh, what is the satisfaction level of your employees, your, your partners remotely? I think that we've, we've touched on Zoom fatigue. We've touched on some of these pieces. But the interesting piece that we've seen that's coming from some of the institutions is that um, students are just as satisfied and in some ways more satisfied with their experiences because of the flexibility. I'm just going to throw that out there to you as, um, as a question of what you're seeing happening with your performance um, of your students or your workforce. Um, and if you're seeing, you know, the same satisfaction, uh, change in, in engagement um, with satisfaction. So whether it's your students or your regular, um, your, you know, your full time employees. I think, David, you had put something into the, the chat here as a response. I, I have to apologize. I had booked off until uh, 3.45, but I have a meeting. At you got to go. <laughs> so it has been a lot of fun. I hope I, I improved the conversation a little bit, but I do have to go. Um, so I'll wish you all a very happy No, day. no problem. Thank you. It is uh, it is the the trials and tribulations of a of of a moving CEO. So you get going. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. Okay, so um, anybody else want to tackle that question regarding you know the productivity or engagement, whether that's um, how you're engaging students um, or um, if you're seeing an increased uh, engagement or. Go ahead, Salar. Yep. That I think you know for our team, just because we we spent a lot of time investing in the the workflows and the not the tools because you know the tools naturally come, but like how how do we create a harmonious way for all of this to come together to maintain that uh, productivity? And for us, our productivity actually went up as a result of the pandemic. Um, but we really needed to be again intentional about you know building that culture virtually. And making sure that you know we're the tools are there, but what do we do with them to make sure that we're alleviating the gaps of like we have a water cooler channel in Slack, right? So I mean, like it's not a crazy innovation; it's just the channel where like it gives everybody the space to share their cute cat photos or dog photos and whatever when you need a break from <laughs> doing the work. Uh, so I think, you know, just being like, that's, that's my word for the day, like really being intentional and proactive about the type of workspace you, you're trying to, and the experience around it that you're looking to design to support the type of objective, uh, you know, that you're trying to achieve in bringing in students. Because students can be great, um, but it can also com work completely the other way um, when you don't have that framework. Like I remember the first year when we brought on interns, this was like four years ago. Um, we didn't have, we didn't know any of this, right? So we were just learning as we went and, you know, each sprint we learned some more and uh, it's just, you know, layer upon layer. Uh, and I think it, it, you know, work integrated learning is something uh, great, like without partners like Tech Nation, Magnet, um, and, you know, the student work placement programs that the Canadian government provides to, supports small mid-sized mid businesses in creating these opportunities. Um, 
you know, uh, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to build up uh, these experiences. So those are my thoughts. I'll pass it back to you. Thanks. It's uh, it's interesting too because you have you've touched on a couple of times about that intentionality and one of uh, especially as you bring students together. Um, I was talking about this recently about these collision conversations which happen in hallways or at the water cooler and those they, and that's where a lot of students find that richness of their experience um, to be able to connect with other people and then their work experience gives them um, those connections that helps them build you know other work experiences so way or Nazim, maybe um, any ideas that you have about how you can make those intentional connections for students yeah sure I'll, I'll start uh, so for us, similar to Solar, we do a quarterly and sometimes semi-annually semi um, NAT promoter score inter internally from our employee back to uh, the leadership and it has gone up uh, throughout COVID. Uh, I think the flexibility of being able to work from home is a plus for, for most of the people that works with us. Um, how to build intent, how to recreate, I guess, that water cooler talk. I was asking about Solar in the chat uh, about that virtual um, reality platform. But what we do is within Slack, there is an app called Donut. Um, I don't know if anyone uses it, but basically it pairs you randomly with someone in the organization. Um, and it would ask you random questions like, what is your favorite child? What's your childhood hero? Or what's your favorite animal? Um, so it, it sparks a random conversation between the two and uh, it would prompt you to set up a meeting. Um, so that's a way to randomly meet someone. We also encourage our students and all the, all the new staff we've onboarded since COVID to reach out to every single person in the organization uh, to set up coffee chats with them. That could be half an hour, 15 minutes, just to get a, a better understanding of what they do in their role and how it relates to the bigger picture. Okay, thanks, Wei. How about you, Nazim? Yeah, um, so we're talking about the small organizations which have less uh, than 10, I don't, um, 10 employees. Uh, probably it's important to uh, to have some industry uh, feedback from industry professionals. So, and that is one thing I wanted to bring to this panel. Um, so, if uh, uh, we could help uh, uh, or could create an incubator um, where professionals would share their experience with uh, companies who um, hire co-op students and those professionals would uh, um, uh, share their experience or maybe uh, perform some audit of the companies and talk to employers to employers and i i, I think that companies uh, will be ready to pay for this uh, uh, so if uh, there would be uh, such a place such an incubator that would be a um, uh, great help for companies and for students. That's great. Thank you so much. Charlotte, are we at time? Are we getting close to time? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we've just gone over slightly. So okay. I just was hoping to wrap it up because the next session is ready, our last session of the day. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for joining us. And we will see you all soon. Stay well. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. We'll be the next session is starting. So everyone can go to the session tab. Um, it is our last session of the day. Um, it has a really cool name. So you should go over there and check it out. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.